liberty lovers, and welcome to the Liberty Mike podcast, broadcasting from an undisclosed location in the heart of Dixie. I am Michael, and I am here with Liberty Larry. How's it going? Doing all right. Yep. So, everybody, um, got some new equipment that hopefully will improve sound quality, at least marginally. So, um, if you have any comments about sound quality, uh, definitely let us know. Um, Particularly if it's worse. <laughs> so, yeah. so if it's that, worse, we definitely need the next. Yeah, we, we will remove pieces yeah. <laughs> and get back to the way it was. Yeah. If it's better, we'd like to know that too, though, just yeah. so I know that I didn't waste money. Absolutely. And uh, and yeah, that's 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 all our that's all our news. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's all. Is that all we got? And of this of all weeks, that's all we got. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that was a great podcast. I hope everybody enjoyed it. Yeah. <laughs> Tune in next week. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. When we finally get this right. <laughs> so I left that off the last podcast. Oh, did you? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so we didn't get it right last uh-huh. week. Maybe we'll get it right this week. We'll see. Yeah. Um, okay. So uh, I don't know where you want to start. You can kind of jump right into it. There's a bunch um, of news. Yeah. There's We we got a full docket this week. Yeah. <laughs> there was a lot going on. I don't know. We if we were start. trying to fill in an extra podcast somewhere along the way, this would be the time. This would have been the week to do it. Yeah. You know, for sure. Um, um, a lot of stuff kind of came up quick. So it was Mother's Day Sunday, which would probably be our next opportunity. Yeah. That may be tough for me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, okay. But yeah, where do you want to start? I don't know. Let's jump in with the Supreme Court. Okay. Um, I, I mean, so, so I, and I'm just letting... I haven't watched as much of the coverage on this as I normally do, but I have seen some coverage of it. And You've been watching a lot of court, I hear. I have been watching a lot of court, but not the Supreme Court. <laughs> yeah, Team Johnny, man. I, I am sucked into the Johnny Depp Amber Heard trial. <laughs> and it's it's funny because it's nothing but a distraction. Oh, like, yeah. I mean, it's it's pure distraction, and I, it's one, but it's just like a bad TV show. Like mm-hmm. You just get sucked into it. And and that's where I'm at. And I got to see it through. And we got another couple of weeks of it. So <laughs> yeah, it's reality TV, and I imagine it's got great ratings. And I suspect that we will see some programming yeah. patterned after it in the future. I, I, it wouldn't surprise me a bit. Yeah. So. Um, but no, there was a a leaked draft uh, from the U.S. Supreme Court um, of a majority opinion overturning Roe versus Wade. So when I first heard this, um, my initial reaction was. I just didn't believe it. The Supreme Court never leaks anything. Yeah. Um, and I just, I didn't really buy it. But now they're talking about like uh, doing an investigation and figuring out what happened. Mm-hmm. So I'm guessing it's legit. Yeah. I mean, I, they well, wouldn't yeah, be they, investigating it if it wasn't yeah, something to Yeah, they have confirmed it. that the draft was legit. Now, yeah. okay, so this doesn't necessarily mean anything either. I mean, it, no, that's not fair to say, I guess. But... um It's very common while they're considering a case for them to write opinions. Multiple opinions. Yeah, and pass them around, uh, which may affect other um, justices' decisions on the case and so forth. And, you know, they're they're all making their legal arguments and and I guess in some ways probably trying to influence each other as well. Um, The majority is based on an initial kind of um, like hand vote type thing. Yeah. Um, so there's, there's still, this doesn't represent a final decision. That's what I'm trying to get. At. Yeah. Um, now I think that it's likely that that decision doesn't change. Yeah. I uh, mean, if they've already written a majority or a, a, a majority opinion on it, I would be surprised, but. Well, like I said, this is something that that's pretty common and while they're still in consideration and, and it, yeah. the opinions can influence other justices to change their position. Yeah. Um, I think with the, the number of justices on the court now that are either just like politically conservative or seem to be politically conservative and, or, um, have a, uh, originalist interpretation of the constitution. I wouldn't expect it to change either. Yeah. Uh, um, because, regardless of what where you feel what you feel about abortion the Roe v Wade decision um is a r- incorrect decision yeah pr- constitutionally speaking constitution they, just yeah strictly constitutionally speaking it it's 
It's an overreach for the federal government. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, going back to the Tenth Amendment, which yeah. uh, says that if it's not specifically uh, a power specifically given to the federal government, then it remains um, a power of the states and the people. Yeah, right? which is so. which is the reason. So I've been saying all weeks. So I've had a lot of people ask me about this, and mm-hmm. um, it's the correct decision. Like, I mean, it's, yeah. this is the, all that's going to happen here is it'll be turned over to the states. And I saw something the other day, something like 26 states have automatic, if Roe v. Wade is overturned, abortion is illegal in those states, like immediately. They have really? like automatic triggers um, set up. I am quite surprised at that. My expectation was that there would be about a dozen states that would limit abortion yeah. to some degree. Um, um, I don't know. Um, just sp- like in Alabama, I think the 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 law that was passed here legislation that was passed here says 15 weeks or something. That's almost halfway through your pregnancy, by the way. Yeah. Um, Uh, yeah. So I I think that even, and, and Alabama is widely considered to be one of the most conservative States in the union. Oh yeah. So, um, I think the Mississippi law is stricter. I think is it the one that triggered the one that that the case is about. Um, I think it's a shorter time period that you have, but uh, I, I don't, I don't remember. I don't know the specifics of what the triggers would be. Mm-hmm. And, and I don't know. I, I need to go back and confirm that. But that was, I just saw something, read something that said 26 states had triggers in to, to make some form of um, a Some ban. kind of restriction. Yeah, some kind of restriction. Yeah. Uh, the idea that abortion is going to be banned in this country is insane. Well, like, it is absolutely yeah. insane. Um all the all that this decision would do is throw it back to the states. Yeah, Which and um, is, I I mean, me and you, I think would agree that that's the right answer. Um, I I think it's more right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, uh, I I think um, I think that the uh, the government should really play no part in medical decisions. Yeah. That's what I think. Um, I think that this is not a question for the government at all beyond the question of, of life or not. And I'm not comfortable with government deciding, defining life either. Yeah. So, um, I don't think that it should be a question for government at all. I think that the, that this, like any other medical decision is between a doctor and a patient. Yeah. I don't, so much. I, I don't know. I'm definitely more on the pro life side. <laughs> I okay. So as far as my personal feelings are concerned, yeah. Um, I would certainly encourage anybody I knew not to have an abortion. Yeah. Yeah. But that's as far. I mean, yeah. because I well, and know, I'm, I'm, I think I've said it exactly like this on the podcast before, but I, I will do it again because I'm sure we have new new listeners. Um, I hope (laughs) we have new listeners since last time this came up. Um, but I I think that the, what we can say for certain is that life begins somewhere between conception and birth. Yeah. Yeah. All right. That seems fair. That's yeah. (laughs) Um, I think really any point you pick between those two points is arbitrary. Yeah. And, um, and I certainly don't think that a bunch of attorneys, uh, in government are in a position to make that decision. Yeah. Um, when life begins. So, uh, I, I don't think that it's a government decision at all. It, it's between a doctor and their patient. Um, those two people are the ones whose conscience it rides on. Well, that's kind of my, been my thing is like, you just, you've got whatever decisions people make as far as this subject is concerned, mm-hmm. they're the ones that have to live with it. Yeah, and I mean, if they've convinced themselves that they're not killing a baby, then, then yeah. they've convinced themselves of that. Well, and the other I part would of it disagree, is disagree, though. <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, I would too. I think to the, hmm. depending. I mean, uh, like I said, there say, are situations where I think that uh, having the ability to perform an abortion is important. Um, yeah. I mean, there are uh, certainly medical um, issues that can arise that would necessitate is a strong word, but certainly, um, incentivize, uh, an abortion. Um, I hope that I never have to make that decision. Yeah. (laughs) Really, I guess, uh, which is kind of a cop out, I suppose. But, um, but we've been arguing for two years that, um, people's medical decisions are their own. Yeah. 
And, uh, yeah. and this applies here too, I think. I, and I agree. I mean, I, I definitely agree with that. Yeah. Um, and it's really hard to say my body, my choice though. And then at the same time say, but you've got to get the vaccine. Like, right. Come on guys. Yeah. Like it's either it is or it isn't. Yeah. Um, now it has occurred to me and I haven't explored this a lot, uh, intellectually, but it has occurred to me that, um, that an overturn of Roe versus Wade, uh, where the federal government, essentially what Roe versus Wade said is the federal government is not permitted to interfere with medical decisions, essentially. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Like that's, that's really what it's, what it says is that, um, that this is private information. Um, and I, I, there is some concern in me that maybe an over, a, an overturn of Roe versus Wade, um, is in the interest in some of these powers, uh, e even on the left, yeah, or maybe even especially on the left, yeah. um, to get rid of a federal uh, prohibition on interfering with medical, with people's uh, medical decisions. Yeah. So, because if you remove a federal prohibition on interfering with people's medical decisions, then all the arguments that prevent them from um, Dive requiring mandates, yeah. uh, vaccine mandates and so forth are gone. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so maybe this is a, a, um, you know, something that they're willing to give up for something else because I think it's fairly certain that, that it was the leak came from the left Yeah, or, or somebody yeah. on the left. Not, I mean, that, not like the left is some kind of monolith or whatever, yeah. but, but, but one of the more liberal interns or somebody like that. Yeah. Or maybe even a judge. Our judge, yeah. I've heard a lot of people say judge, and maybe it could, not saying it's definitely not a judge, I tend to think it's probably somebody in one of their one of their assistants or somebody. Yeah, you know. I, I suspect so too. Um, but If nothing else, just to put that shield between the judge and, you know. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the, and, uh, you know, I think after I make this statement, we'll play a little clip. Um I suppose I don't know what order to do all this in, um, all right. but I I think that really what this leak was all about was about motivating um, Democrats to get out and vote in the midterms because right now all the opinion polls say that they are getting stomped. Oh yeah, um, or I say right now at least before this leak. Yeah, the opinion polls were saying that the the Democrats were getting stomped in the midterms. Yeah. Um, so I think what this really was all about is about creating some outrage on the left and some motivation to go out and vote. I do think also though, um, that this was premature. Yeah. That, I, that you too, can't maintain the outrage. That I was long. fixing to say, yeah. Well, and it's just the same way the whole time Trump was in office. Like mm -hmm. it was the outrage was up to 110 the whole time. Yeah. And you just, after a while, you just can't maintain it. <laughs> yeah. Like, um, on the other hand, this could be reinforced when the actual decision comes out. Yeah. So it could be, you know, let's go ahead and create, like, let's, let's start this process now. Yeah. Um, and go ahead and get people upset. And then when the actual opinion comes out, They'll already be organized. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, hard to say, but um, let's go ahead and play this clip or maybe not. I'm going to, we're <laughs> going to play the clip and we're going to see if it fits. How's that? <laughs> All right. That sounds like a plan. <laughs> the other statement that stands out is the uh, Democratic National Committee saying in part, make no mistake, reproductive rights will be on the ballot and this midterm election is more important now than ever before. Hmm. That reflects, of course, the popular opinion of Democrats and a majority opinion of Americans. If you look at CBS News polling, it shows most prefer keeping Roe versus Wade in place and federal abortion rights intact. But what this statement from a very crass political strategic perspective is also saying, essentially, is Democrats wake up, get off the couch and go out there and do something about this by volunteering, by donating money, and most of all, by voting for Democratic candidates. Yeah. So that's that's really what it's all about. Yeah. Give us your money and give us your vote. Yeah. Yeah. Well, motivating their side, you know. Yeah. Um, because they don't have much to be. Yeah. I mean, if, the, if you it, look it's hard at, to support the current yeah. regime. Yeah. 
I, I, administration, whatever. Yeah, I don't, I don't want to yeah. sound like I'm being propagandistic. <laughs> All right, yeah. but but you're right. They're, they're, but I refer not... to the Republican side as regimes too. too so yeah, exactly. <laughs> But but either way, like I say, there's not a whole lot for them to run on right now. Mm-hmm. Like I mean, what what do they have that they can tout? You know. Um, and this was uh, you and I had talked about this a little bit, um, and then uh, Dave Smith said the same thing. So I don't think we ended up saying it on the podcast because we don't <laughs> want to be derivative. But um, with the Elon Musk thing, well, I, oh, okay. So the the reason that it dovetails in, I think, is that. Um, what this really shows is a fear of democracy. Because the truth is that if it gets kicked down to the states, it's just a democratic process again at the state level. If the states ban or restrict abortion in a way that makes the people unhappy, then the people can vote them out. Yeah, exactly. Um, And so it's not likely, I don't, I mean, he pointed out that the majority of Americans approve I don't buy that. I keep well, I keep hearing that tossed yeah. around, and I don't know um, what polls they're they're specifically referencing when they say that. I, I keep I just hearing don't the, buy the, it. the number sixty nine percent, which I think is really funny in context. <laughs> right. um, but uh, I think that it's depending on how they ask the question. That's what that's what I, my um, response have been this week because I don't think that it's unlikely. Um, I think you know. Just in a general question, um, do you believe that abortion should be legal? I would say yes. Yeah. Uh, even though I don't really approve of it, but the, you know, like I said, there are um, situations where I think it's at least close to necessary. You, there yeah. are um, moments, and like even up to the point of birth, yeah. because because there are things that can go wrong well, that threaten the life of both the child and the mother, and you got to make a decision. Yeah. And if you decide to keep the mother alive so that she can have another child down the road somewhere um, and not leave a, a, a very unhappy father with a, um, if there with even a child. Is, if there well, even is sure. a father. I mean, yeah. but just even assume, okay. So assuming that there is. Assuming right? that there is, like, yeah. Im- imagine this, this situation. Like, uh, you, and uh, part of this is maybe some assumptions or my, um, personal experience, you know, or based off of my personal experience, I think that a lot of um, a lot of fathers are more attached to the woman than the child. Yeah. Certainly at birth, and probably for some time afterwards. Yeah. Right. Um, so imagine you're in the situation where this woman that you love, uh, that that you have gotten pregnant, and she's you know carried this child for nine months, and um, now she's giving birth and something goes terribly wrong. Yeah. And the doctor asks you, uh, to make a decision about, we can only save one. Yeah. Which one do you want to save? Yeah. Now there's a couple of things going on here. Like e- even if you choose to save the child, now here you are a single father. Yeah. You've just lost this woman you love. Because of this child that you now have to take care. I mean, I don't know. I just it, it seems like it creates it's such an, a terrible situation. Yeah. Um. In that case, uh. And you know, the other part of it is that you've known the woman for at least nine months. Yeah. <laughs> you know. Yeah. Um. And you don't know the child at all. Yeah. You weren't yeah. carrying it for nine months. Yeah. I I think that I think that most men in that situation would choose to save the woman. Yeah. Um. And that is an abortion. Yeah. Oh yeah. I, and I, I don't disapprove of that decision because I'm pretty sure that's the decision that I would make. Yeah. No, I, I definitely am with you on that. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I think that if you just ask the question, do you think abortion should be legal, that a majority of people would say yes, because some kind of situation like that might pop into their head or, you know, rape yeah. or uh, incest or, you know, yeah. all without, these other things. Without more like nuance in the question, mm-hmm. I think you may get that type of response. Yeah. But I think the more you drill the question down, the mm-hmm. more you would get more. Yeah. You start slicing yeah. parts of that out. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. No, I, I and I agree with that. Um, but if you kick it down to the states, if states that have a majority population that don't approve of restrictions on abortion place restrictions on abortion. Those people aren't going to be in office very long, probably. Yeah. Um, and it, it creates a more localized control, which we always advocate. Yeah. 
Well, and that's the reason I think that this is the right decision. Mm-hmm. Um, let Because th- the truth be told, I mean, this country is a very big place with a very variety of people in it. Mm-hmm. And um, it makes more sense for each area to kind of be able to decide what they think is right and what they don't. Yeah. Um, and, and to force, like, just take New York as an example, you know, mm-hmm. to force New York into the same type of, to just say no abortions in New York would would not make a lot of sense for New York because people in New York are okay with that. Or at least New York City. Yeah. <laughs> right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, it, it just wouldn't make sense to force that upon them because they're, even even if you think abortion is wrong, which I do, it you're not going to create a better situation for the people in New York mm-hmm. by banning it. Yeah. And I didn't clip it, but Biden actually said that he didn't feel like he was comfortable letting the populations make this decision. Yeah. Right now. Um well, because he knows which direction it's going to go. Well, it, it, you know, and it comes back to this kind of fear of democracy. And and the reason, like I said, the reason it dovetails into the Elon Musk buying Twitter thing is is the same It's the same it's thing. It's the same it, kind of thing. Yeah. It, the truth be told, Everybody talks about how good democracy is and how they want to preserve democracy or have democracy. But as long as you is, vote the way they want you to. Yeah, the truth is, is <laughs> they don't want democracy at all. They want their side to win. Yeah. Um, and at the end of the day, they'll do whatever it takes for their side to win. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and so, and whatever they've got to do, Twitter's a good example because it's became pretty clear that if you give people real freedom on Twitter, that things can happen that the establishment doesn't care for. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, the thing that keeps coming up with the, the Twitter thing is the question of whether, um, Elon Musk will allow Donald Trump back on. Yeah. Yeah. That's the real concern. That's the concern. Is that Donald Trump would be able to reach people easily again. Yeah, exactly. Because, oh my God, if he's able to reach people, they might vote for him. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) And that would just be the, not that people didn't vote for him the last time. But well, that's because he was on Twitter and he could reach people. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, he's been cut off and he's been cut off entirely f- from being able to bypass the press. Not entirely, I guess, but um, Pretty close, his, though. his biggest outlet for bypassing the press, being able to speak directly to the people was taken away from. him. Yeah, yeah. And um, and, and it's been being taken away from people of all kinds of people since it's happened to Trump. Yeah. Um, and before. And before too, but mm-hmm. um, but the idea that you would remove the sitting president from Twitter is yeah. just in, and I mean I, they've moved some con- removed some congressmen and different um, quite a few different like high level people yeah and now you have this great paradox now with the Ministry of Truthiness yeah. that. Or, or I'm sorry, the Disinformation Governance Board. Is that what they're officially calling it? Because I, I, all I I've so. heard it to is Ministry of Truth. Yeah, which I didn't write it down, but I'm pretty sure it's <laughs> it's actually called the Disinformation Governance Board. Yeah. Um, but the you know they're they're making these statements along the lines of that this is to protect your free speech, and but at the same time, what they're saying is that. In order to protect your free speech, we can't allow a free speech absolutist to take over Twitter, Twitter yeah. because that would restrict your free speech by allowing other people to speak. Yeah. And, and, and part of it is just this, this fallacy that it's a fixed pie, yeah. that if one person's speaking, then that takes away time from somebody else, which isn't true to begin with. It's, yeah. it's one of the great economic fallacies, too, but we'll talk about that some other time. <laughs> right. um, but yeah, just because... Uh, you know, conservatives or even even the alt right, the alt right, yeah, are talking on Twitter does not prevent progressives from talking on Twitter. Exactly. Um, but uh, anyway, yeah. So it, at the same time, they're saying, well, we have to, um, we can't allow a free speech absolutist to take over this platform uh, because it would put limits on your free speech, which doesn't make sense to begin with. And then on the flip side of that, they're saying in order to ensure your free speech, we need to more strictly enforce, you know, some kind of regulation on speech. Yeah. (laughs) Like, (laughs) and I I don't understand how anybody can listen to this and, and be sucked into it. I don't know. I, I can't understand how anybody in America actually, 
would approve of a disinformation governance board. Because here's the other thing that I think I would hope that we have all learned about government is that the only thing that they're, they're interested, the only kind of speech they're interested in restricting is the kind that challenges them. Yeah. That's harmful to them. And it doesn't matter. They're not interested in truth. No, never at all. Yeah. Um, and in fact, this woman, uh, Nina Jankowitz, um, was promoting the, uh, you know, Biden's laptop is Russian disinformation story. She yeah. was wrong. Yeah. All right. I, I, okay. So actually, that's the only example you really need because it doesn't matter how many other times she was wrong and she has been. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but just the idea that the person that's in charge of determining what's true and what's false missed something so completely. Yeah. And something that was restricted. Yeah. Well, and that was restricted in a way that I've never seen before. Unprecedented uh, yeah, in this country as far as I know. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so uh, th- what it comes down to is that you can't, you can't trust somebody to know truth better than, than others. Yeah. The, the, the way the, to, and, and she even said something, I didn't clip this either. She said that the, uh, that regulations on free speech were um, important for the survival of democracy or something like that. Yeah. All right. Um, and I disagree entirely. I, like absolutely a hundred percent. That that is a completely yeah, false statement just, as far as I'm concerned. To me, that statement doesn't even make logical sense. Yeah. Um, you need to have alternate opinions, alternative opinions out there. Yeah. Um, right now, the safeguards of democracy in this country are independent media like us. Yeah. Absolutely. That are out there sell- telling you the things that the mainstream media doesn't want you to hear. Yeah. That the government doesn't want you to hear, um, you know, that we're talking about the background of the Russia-Ukraine war in this incredibly propagandistic um, presentation uh, culture yeah. uh, of what's happening in in Ukraine right now. Um, and it, again, I hate that I have to say this every time. This isn't a, an approval of what Putin's doing no. or or any kind of um, advocacy for Putin. The point is, the history did not begin in February of this year. Yeah, absolutely. That there were certainly things that the U.S. did to provoke this, the U.S. and NATO did to provoke this, that they, it was very clear that they were aware yeah. that it was a provocation when they did it. Yeah. Um, and that there were things that they absolutely refused to do that could have been done to prevent this as well. Exactly. Um. And in fact, uh, yeah, we're, I'm really bouncing around. I apologize. <laughs> but um, it, it seems clear now that there was a decision made by the Ukrainian government in November, roughly, um, that they were going to assault the Donbass region. Yeah. That the Ukrainian government, the Ukrainian military, was going to assault the Donbass region yeah. and bring these breakaway provinces into line. Yeah. Um, which is probably why... In January, um, the Biden administration was so confident that uh, Russia was going to invade yeah. because Russia had already made the decision they weren't going to allow this to yeah, happen. The, exactly. Yeah. That they were going to protect their people in the Donbass. Yeah. Um, so with an all out assault planned in the Donbass by Ukraine, the U.S. government could probably feel pretty confident that Russia was going to respond yeah. and that this was a way that they might respond. Yeah. Right. Um, and then they were they were leaking this information to preempt the decision by the Russians to try and um, discourage them from doing it. That's the story that, that we were heard, were right? Saying, like, yeah, I about that. all these leaks oh, yeah. of intelligence information. Um, so then, in at the beginning of February, there was a huge increase in artillery, uh, Ukrainian army artillery assaults on cities in the Donbass. Yeah, and then. And they had a buildup of troops there. There's a, a huge buildup of uh, troops on the edge of the Donbass as well by the Ukrainian army. Yeah. Um, and then Russia invaded to preempt <laughs> this assault. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, but uh, you're not getting that out of the mainstream media. Nope, not at all. It was a totally unprovoked invasion as far as the mainstream media is concerned. Yeah. Um, and that's just not true. No. Uh, and it's... You, you can't put... 
throughout history, governments have tried to do what's being done here with regulating speech and mm-hmm. controlling what can be said and what can't. It never ends well. Like this isn't something that, I mean, it's not, you can't act like this hasn't been tried. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and and you can't complain about, um, you know, uh, Putin controlling the media and putting down dissent in his country and then do the create same in this ours. thing here. Yeah. Um, Let's uh, listen to uh, Mayorkas talk about what the role of this new disinformation governance board is uh, real quick, and then we'll we'll comment more on this. Sounds good. And the board, this working group, internal working group, will draw from best practices and communicate those best practices to the operators, because the board does not have operational authority. Will American citizens be monitored? No. Guarantee what, that. Well, so what we do, we, we in the Department of Homeland Security don't monitor uh, American citizens. You don't, but will we, this board change that? No, no, no. The board does not have any operational authority or capability. What it will do is gather together best practices in addressing the threat of disinformation from foreign state adversaries, from the cartels, and disseminate those best practices to the operators that have been executing in addressing this threat for years. Okay, um, so that's their role. They're just uh, developing best practices to pass out to the other agencies that actually enforce stuff. (laughs) Um, Yeah, because that's what we want, right? (laughs) Well, one thing that stood out to me in that is that he keeps talking about operators. Operators is a special forces term. Oh yeah. As far yeah. as I know. Yeah. Um, like you have CIA operatives and Delta Force operators. Yeah. Uh, but <laughs> you know, I, I'm sure it has other uses in government, but well, I, I have always, so. <laughs> I have always heard the word operators in government, um, used when referring to military, forces, yeah. yeah, military special forces. Wow. Um, now the whole thing about uh, when she asks, um, you, "You won't be? A, can you guarantee we won't be monitoring American citizens?" Which he doesn't exactly answer. Yeah. Um, he answers with a semest- semantic, like um, deflection, I guess. Yeah. Well, we don't at the Department of Homeland Security. We don't actually monitor any Americans. Yeah. Um, and what he's actually saying there is, we just pass off information to other agencies, like the FBI, to monitor the Americans that we want. Monitor. Yeah. I mean, that's that's what really what he being means. Done, yeah. Um, so uh, it, it's it doesn't make me feel better. <laughs> yeah. All right. <laughs> about this. So I, I think the whole thing is absurd and um, is incredibly dangerous. Yeah. And uh, well, I it's all the it's, idea that government can define truth is yeah. I mean, beyond the, absurd. The, the, this is something since COVID, particularly, but this went on before then that government has decided they want to start doing. Mm-hmm. I mean, this is, this is, and this is just another step towards that type of thing of just having a board that's, you know, defines what's okay and what's not. Yeah. Um, and it, if you have confidence in government um, being the arbiters of truth, uh, I just want to play this bit of um, Scott Horton responding to this uh discussion of the um of the disinformation governance board on kennedy um where he essentially says uh you know this lady nina jankowitz um i would like her to fact check these things all right and so here i'm he excited goes. let's hear it <laughs> you know bill clinton lied that the serbs had slaughtered a hundred thousand kosovar albanians in order to launch that war in uh, 1999 W. Bush lied that Saddam Hussein was going to give nuclear bombs to Osama bin Laden to, you know, blow up your hometown with. Barack Obama claimed that Muammar Gaddafi was about to murder 700,000 people, the entire population of Benghazi, and he was passing out Viagra to all his troops to rape every woman and girl in the in the country of Libya at the time. A total hoax. He also claimed that Zarqawi's men 
were just moderate rebels in Syria as they were building the caliphate, leading to then Iraq War III, another half a million people killed, mm. and uh, started the war in Yemen, which Donald Trump ludicrously claimed we were getting paid $450 billion from the Saudis to wage. At what price for a genocide when, of course, they spend a couple, two, three billion a year on the war? And, of course, during that whole time, the CIA and the FBI told 1,000 lies about Donald Trump, which Juan still believes some of, apparently, in this Russiagate hoax, which never happened whatsoever. And then they lied that, get this, that Russian spies planted crackhead Hunter's laptop at a repair shop in mm -hmm. Delaware. Um, which the entire media then went along with that hoax and, and big tech in crushing that. Scott Horton's the man is <laughs> <laughs> really, I, yeah, I don't know is. that you can make the point better than he just did. Yeah. Um, y you know, we've talked about the, the, uh, support of the Syrian, the Syrian rebels. Um, and he brings up Zarqawi there who, uh, that's Abu Musab al-Zarqawi, um, who, pledged allegiance to Osama bin Laden in 2004 before we were supporting him in Syria. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's just, yeah, the, the list keeps going. He also points out, a, um, a few moments later that, uh, that this lady is connected to, um, wait, what was the organization? I don't even remember. I might have to go back and listen. <laughs> oh, I don't know. Um, let's see. Well, now I can't remember. Um, but the, uh, you know, the, it's just a general conflict of interest. She's, yeah. um, connected to some organization that, uh, played a part in the 2014, um, Maidan coup. Oh yeah. yeah, uh, yeah. I can't remember what it, no, what it was I can't that, remember either. but anyway, um, yeah. So this is our new minister of truthiness, <laughs> minister of truth, Minis ministress. <laughs> oh yeah. Ministress of truthiness. <laughs> yeah. I don't know how you genderize some of these words. No, I don't know. Um, but yeah, yeah. I mean, I, everybody in this country should resist this to the greatest possible degree. Absolutely. Um, it is an absolute overstep uh, of government. In fact, they are prohibited yeah. by their constitution and the oath they took to it of creating this organization. Yeah. But that, of course, has never really stopped them. So. Yeah. Hasn't lately. <laughs> I don't think it ever did. You don't think it did? No, I, I remember my, my mom asking me because I was I was on some soapbox about uh, presidents ignoring the Constitution. Yeah. And um, she asked me, well, who was the first president that overstepped the limits of the Constitution? I said, George Washington. Yeah. Right. <laughs> it was George Washington, the Whiskey Rebellion. Yeah. Like, he didn't have the power to, to do what he did in response. To, anyway. Yeah. Um, don't need to go down that rabbit hole today. We got enough to talk about, <laughs> yeah. and we're running low on time. So, um, what else we got? Uh, so I feel like I'm forgetting. Yes, yeah, that's, that's because we are, and it was the it was the something that I didn't write down. Um, it was something that you wanted to talk about. I thought uh, maybe, <laughs> which is why I didn't write it down. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh well. Um, We'll just, uh, you know, we'll just keep on, I suppose, with wherever we go to next. I Something that I have been thinking about um, recently um, with, you know, speaking of gendered language, uh, is that, I, okay, so, you know, certainly plenty of comparisons have been made between um, the the fall of this empire and the fall of the Roman empire. And, and, um, a lot I, of parallels you can draw. Yeah. I've talked about, uh, the hedonism that results from just, you know, kind of unprecedented wealth. And, um, and while it, you know, it feels like we're not that wealthy, we really are. Oh yeah. Um, when you look at world history and, uh, but I, I think that another part of it is, um, the reason particularly younger people seem at least to me to be so maladjusted yeah. um is that there's this uh i don't know there's this nihilistic strain that's find found its way into education of younger children and i think a prime example of that is 
And so, of course, you know, nihilism is just like rejecting all convention. Um, and this, uh, you know, part of it is this idea that there's no real truth, that it's all subjective and yeah. so on. Um, and this is a, I you think. You can make this up is, your own truth. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, this is, a, I think this, that this is a, a part of um, an approach to looking at the world. I, I think that this is a, a philosophy that's important for people that have an interest in learning yeah. when they're older and they've had some, uh, you know, established ideas about what the world is yeah. um, to bring you back around and have you go back and question that stuff when you're, when you're mature. I think that, um, I think that introducing the idea that, uh, you know, gender is just a construct. I, I, okay. So actually <laughs> let me start at this point. Um, I think, I think that most people, and I, I've worldwide yeah. um, define their world in a lot of ways in binary. Yeah. And I think we see a lot of that right now with the, you know, kind of the culture war as well. Um, I think that this is ingrained in us that, you know, you have day and night, light and dark, good and bad, you know, male yeah. and female, like the, you, you define a lot of things by their opposites. Yeah. Um, that these two, ends of the spectrum exist and like you're on one side or the other. Yeah. And, and this is how you form your worldview. I, yeah. I think that this is an important way of how we, we form our worldview. And I think if you start taking down these concepts that there's anything that's, that's solid in children that are, that are young, yeah. um, that they never create a coherent worldview. Yeah. Um, and, and that's part of what I think is the the danger of this way of of teaching children that all of the conventions are are made up to challenge them all. And I I absolutely believe in challenging the status quo. Oh yeah. Um, I, I mean, and I think that uh, that I started to do that very openly when I was in my mid teens. Yeah. Um, and I, I you know I, I think that that rebellion against the system is important. I think that it's important to um, to be skeptical. Um, but I think that very early in life, you need to create a kind of a basis from which to start <laughs> Yeah. before you start tearing everything down. Yeah. Um, that, that we're not creating, I mean, to, I guess to use like a builder term, like that we're by starting with this nihilistic view of the world. So young, you're not creating a foundation on which to build you know, the ideas and the worldview and the approach to, to life, yeah. um, that I think is important. Yeah. I, I think that, that there needs to be a, a strong, a solid foundation there, um, from which to, to jump into some of these more, um, you know, more radical approaches yeah. that that just comes later. Yeah. And, but we're, we're starting really early. Oh yeah. With this. I mean, with the, like ungendered children, Yeah, <laughs> you know, like let them decide when they're old enough. Well, how in the world are they supposed to decide if they, if you've never given them the, the two choices? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Well, I mean, of course the answer to that is, well, there's more than two choices, right? But yeah. like, it, you, I don't know how you expect to a child to choose from a spectrum of things that they don't understand at all. Yeah. Yeah. That you've given them no base to understand. Yeah. I don't know. Um, so you need, this is own, only, you need their own for school board again, Mike. <laughs> I don't think this is much of a problem here, but is it? I don't know. You got two kids in school, so it's not great. I mean, it's not as bad as it is in a lot of places, but mm -hmm. I mean, the you know, it's it's that stuff is out there. Yeah. Like I mean, in it's out there everywhere. It's not just in school. It's mm -hmm. you know they they pick this stuff up from all kinds of places. Yeah, well, I mean, it's out there in the culture everywhere. We talk yeah. about, um, you know, all the TV series. Uh, you have to have, um, you, you have to have off. a gay couple. Yeah. You have to have the um, the uh, mixed race couple. Um, I don't know. Those are the two things that just like seem to come up over and over and over and over and over yeah. again. Um, that I see in like, even in commercials, <laughs> you yeah, know, right. like it, luckily I don't have to see a lot of commercials these days cause I don't have yeah. real TV, but, um, yeah. Yeah. I, I, I am a person that certainly advocates for tolerance 
that advocates for adults to make their own decisions about their lives. Um, but I think that, that one of our roles, and I mean all of us as an adult, is to create a strong foundation from which um, a, a child can develop a worldview. Yeah. yeah. And you don't do that by telling them that everything, that nothing's real. Yeah. Yeah. That's not, that's not a good starting point. No, um, definitely. You have to believe in something before you can believe in nothing, right? Yeah, exactly. I mean, I don't know. Yeah. So this is just like some thoughts that have been bubbling around, yeah, <laughs> in my head. So, well, I did um, remember what the other thing was I wanted to mention. And it's not that we need to go too deep into, but um, there. What's up? No, go ahead. Uh, um, so the feds decided to raise the interest rates. I guess it was Wednesday. I got a notification that they were going to raise the rates by a half a percent. Um, so like immediately after almost the next day, the stock market started tanking. <laughs> so, which I've been saying for a while now, since inflation got bad, that it's only a matter of time. I mean, the, the only thing that the Fed can do is raise the rates. Yeah. Um, and really the only that, reason they're, that they're raising the rates is so that they can lower them again soon. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's true too. Because the the whole problem is is they've left them too low too long. Mm -hmm. Um and I mean I I don't know. I I mean me personally, I don't think the Fed should control the rates, but yeah. I mean there should you, be no Fed. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But if you buy into all of that, you know, the um if you buy into the narrative, the idea is is you lower rates during the recession and then you raise them up. Mm -hmm. And what's happened is, is ever since 08, they've lo been lowering the rates and they've never raised them back. Yeah. So we're in this and now things are fixing to get bad again and there's nothing they can do. Like that, I mean, they're, they're hung here. Yeah. Well, and we're in a position where interest rates are well below inflation rates. Yeah. Um, and that's, that kind of inversion is a problem also. Yeah. Um, e you know, it's, I was talking uh, about this with somebody the other day. Um, they're actually advocating for plans that, that make the problem that they're advocating these plans to fix worse. Right. Yeah. So uh, for example, you know, okay, inflation is high. Oh yeah. Okay. So we were going to talk about, um, the, the oil companies, the energy oh, companies. I have forgotten that, about that. Yeah. yeah. That was, <laughs> all right. So we got it now. Yeah, we're back. <laughs> yeah. Um, the, uh, say, for example, the, um, the energy uh, or gas prices are so high. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and actually, like, the, so the Democrats have a plan. Let's go ahead and play that clip, and then we can oh, go yeah. into what. I forgot we had a clip for that. Yeah. Man, I'm just all over the place with forgetting stuff today. Yeah, well, I'm, <laughs> I'm just kind of all over the place. So, um, yeah, let's play that clip about what the, the Democrats want to do here, and then we'll talk. Right. That, that'll get us a good starting point to talk about this. Sounds good. Yeah. With inflation eating into everyone's bottom line, Democrats came out swinging Thursday, looking to land a punch on oil companies and their record profits. They are hoarding the windfall while keeping prices high for people at the pump. Their new bill would give the Federal Trade Commission the power to investigate the way energy companies set prices. Okay, we all know how prices are set, right? <laughs> Well, if you've been listening to the, for this podcast for a while, you do. Yeah. But if you're a new listener, you might not know. Well, okay. So in this particular case, it's going to be inputs um, and then supply and demand. Yeah. So, but uh, well, I say inputs, it, it's going to be inputs, um, labor costs. Uh, when I say inputs, I mean like raw material. Yeah. Stuff. Um, labor costs, transportation, uh, delivery, um, and then a little profit built in. Yeah. Otherwise, there's no point in doing all the other yeah, work. Why, why bother if you're not right. going to make a profit? <laughs> yeah. So um, it's not like this is a, some kind of mystery, like how this is happening. Now, the idea that right now yeah. um, the energy companies have decided that they are going to withhold supply, which is a fallacy to begin with. But, so let's start there. Like the idea that you withhold supply to drive prices up yeah. – um, is absurd to begin with, especially in an industry where there's a uh, multiple competitors, yeah. like even cartels, like the reason OPEC doesn't actually control prices is because somebody tries to cheat along the way. Yeah. Um, because if you're, if you're withholding your product, 
you're not selling as you're much. You're not of it. selling it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. Uh, it, so, and, and you, the whole idea is to make money off what you're selling, right? So, <laughs> um, I mean, I could invent some numbers to try and uh, illustrate, but, uh, but I mean, just like think through it yourself. Like, yeah. if if the goal is to make as much profit as you can, yeah. then choosing not to sell your product, even if it drives, like. How even though you're controlling the price by withholding it, mm -hmm. you've still got to sell it to make the profit. Right. Even if you're raising the price as you go. Yeah. Um, how quickly do prices have to rise to make withholding the product worthwhile? Worthwhile. Exactly. Because the whole time your operation is still running, by the way. Yeah. Like, I mean, th that, so since you're withholding, doesn't that doesn't mean like drilling and stuff doesn't stop. <laughs> yeah. Um, so the uh, the idea that they're that the energy companies have decided um, that they're going to uh, limit the supply to to drive prices up. Yeah. My question to them would be, why now? Yeah. Why didn't they do that before then? Yeah. I mean, it, the, it, you know, it comes back to the the whole. Uh, well, you know, the reason the prices are going up now is because of greedy corporations. Well, weren't they greedy two years ago? Yeah. That's just it. The, this whole operation works off greed. Yeah. <laughs> like, I mean, it, it's always worked that way. So this isn't something new for 2022. It's not even really greed so much. It's just self-interest. Well, yeah. Yeah. I'd agree with that. You but know, yeah. So, um, <laughs> you know, we started somewhere else and we were like, oh, well, this will be a good jumping off point. Now <laughs> I can't remember where we were to try and get back to it. Um, but uh, the, yeah. The idea that the um, that the energy companies have now decided to do this is it, it doesn't make any sense, and it just so happens to coincide um, with uh, the administration limiting production of the resource in question. Yeah. All right. Um, the uh, the well, entire world cutting off one of the biggest energy producers in the in I the world. I was fixing to say the the deal with Russia is is really what's going on here. I mean it, that's it, it's it's a part of what's it's definitely a, it's a, a part of I'd what's say going a on. large part. I mean it may not be the whole picture, but mm. it's it's a large factor. Well, I, I don't know that it's any bigger really than limiting production in this country. And then of course, um mm. it's obviously not just energy prices that are going up, right? Yeah. Um, it's all prices that are going well, up. Well, all prices are going and, up. And by the way, that includes for the energy companies. Yeah. Like all yeah. the things that they're doing are costing more as well. Well, you had mentioned, because I had asked before the show mm -hmm. um, when you let me listen to that clip, uh, because they said that, that energy companies are having huge windfalls right now. Yeah, I don't know where that comes from. Um, I haven't been able to verify that. I'm, well, I, and I've heard it multiple times. Like that's mm -hmm. not the first time I've heard that said and i mean and it may be true I'm it not, may be true i'm not saying it's not true mm -hmm. i'm just curious to where that's coming from <laughs> yeah and and i i couldn't uh i can't answer that because yeah. i don't know like i said i haven't been able to verify that um yeah. I, I think that it's just a talking point i think it's fabricated yeah um it, you know it creates resentment uh yeah. towards the energy companies like shift the blame there you go yeah. yeah, which is really what this is about is this, shifting the blame, yeah. um, because the I think that the biggest culprit, well, the biggest culprit is obviously the U.S. government, because it's the U.S. government that has limited production of this resource in our country. Yeah. Um, it has uh, um, it has also been the biggest advocate for cutting Russia out of the world economy. Yeah. Um, and I think most importantly, it's the U.S. government that keeps increasing the money supply by huge factors. Well, that's what's causing the inflation we're feeling now. Right, um, um, which is those price jumps. And and that actually brings us back to what I couldn't remember <laughs> a moment ago, <laughs> yeah. which is um, that they're proposing solutions that actually increase the problem that they're trying to solve. Yeah. So uh, people are complaining about um, the costs of gas, you know, the energy costs, costs at the pump, whatever. This yeah. is really affecting the normal, the the regular, the average American family so much, et cetera. Yeah. Um, and so the administration's answer is, well, what we'll do is we'll give you money to, to offset the cost. Costs, yeah. Right. But where are you getting that money from? Well, you're printing it. You're printing it. And guess what happens when you print the money? <laughs> it becomes worth less. Yes. <laughs> so this is like a, a cycle that you can't get yeah, out of. Yeah, it's a feedback loop. Yeah, exactly. Um, that they, they, but it, it, it works as a bribe. It makes yeah. it appear to the, I think most Americans don't understand economics well enough um, yeah. to realize what's happening there. Yeah. Or they've been trained to, to think that it, 
you know, that these debts don't matter, that printing money doesn't matter, that, oh, that's just the answer. Well, a few years ago, I would have agreed with you, but the the tougher times that we're heading into, mm -hmm. a lot more people have educated themselves on particularly inflation and things like that. Yeah. Like this whole deal that, um, because Putin, uh, I mean, Putin, um, Biden keeps saying that Putin's price hike. Yeah. Um, and people aren't buying that. Like, I mean, they, they may not know a lot, but they know that this isn't Putin's fault. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. this is, this is a, a lot of people understand the fact that this is too much money in the system. Yeah. The, the, in fact, that the system was anticipating this war so much that prices started to rise way before way the war. Way before there, yeah. yeah. So. Um, and that it's affecting so much more. Yeah. And, and while we understand that energy inputs are a part of every industry really. So uh, yeah. rising energy prices are going to drive prices up all over. Yeah. Um, not to this degree, not to, not like this. And that's, that's really the thing. Um, and you know, but in the beginning they tried to blame it more on, um, the COVID because when yeah. the fir prices first started going up, it was COVID. It was, Oh, well, supply chain issues and, and mm -hmm. shutting everything down is, is, it's just supply and demand. And then, and then they went from that to Putin's price hike. Right. <laughs> right. So, but, People are starting to see through it. I, I hope you're right. Yeah. Um, I have less confidence in that. I don't. <laughs> yeah. I don't think people get a you. You certainly have to educate yourself because yeah. you don't get you're in most gonna, places a, a good economic education. Certainly yeah. in public school system or university system here. No. Um, well, and and then in what I would call more free market media, mm -hmm. um, your media would supply some of this education. Yeah. Um, but you don't get that in the U.S. here. Like, our media isn't going to tell you what's really going on with this stuff. I mean, you can find it. It's out there. There's people you can find and listen to. I mean, that's where I get this information from. Go to, right? to Mises.org. Yeah, exactly. I mean, there's this information is out there, but your mainstream media isn't going to be where you're going to source it. Mm. <laughs> so. Yeah. Um, yeah, and they're, they're just going to continue to... So, that's uh, another thing that's going on is this because there's so much money in the system and because interest rates are so low. And I promise I'll wrap this up really quickly here because um, we're, we're we're going long. We're, we're on a, we're on an hour about. <laughs> yeah. um, but uh, and we'll probably spend more time on this in the in the future. Yeah. Um, we're going to have to because things are fixed to start getting real. <laughs> yeah, that, you might be right. Um, so. The, uh, as, as an example, the property values are really high right now yeah. and there's construction going on everywhere. everywhere. Yes. All right. So this is probably a problem. Yeah. Um, this is almost certainly a malinvestment as the Austrians would put it, yeah. uh, because the, because money is cheap, yep. um, and these prices are high. There's a whole bunch of, of businessmen, uh, entrepreneurs and, and established businessmen that are looking at this and saying, okay, I can take out a big loan at a low percentage interest. Yeah. Um, I can use that to, uh, to build all these construction, you know, uh, do all this construction, yeah. housing or whatever, yeah. and sell it off and make just Tons windfall yeah. and easily pay back my loans and so forth. Yeah. Right? So... They're taking out this money. They're beginning this construction. Yeah. Now, as interest rates are forced to be pushed up or as just the economy starts to, to fall apart, as yeah. people aren't able to purchase these things, yeah. then they're going to run into a problem. Yeah. Um, and so I, what I suspect that we'll find is in a couple of years, there's going to be a whole bunch of unfinished construction. Yep. There's going to be a whole bunch of debt that was never paid off. Yep. Um, I would say that there would be a bunch of uh, banks that that um, that closed, but I suspect that the government will bail them out. The government will prop up the banks. I mean, we've seen this happen before. I mean, mm -hmm. 07, 08, like yeah. we, I, I've lived through this once. This is mm -hmm. my second go round here. Yeah. So I remember kind of how things played out last time. Well, there and was the dot com bubble at the beginning of the. Of the that was 2000s the catalyst too. this last yeah. time. I think inflation will be the catalyst this time. Mm -hmm. So, um, because you're right, the dot com bubble and them kind of inflating that is what mm -hmm. caused the housing crash. Right. Um, and I think that what will wind up happening this time will be the same type thing, except it's going to be inflation that causes the. Mm -hmm. the interruption for the housing market to crash again yeah um but it's it's going to happen it's not a question of if but when right um, and it could be five ten years from now 
Mm -hmm. I don't think so, though. I mean, I think yeah. we're probably a few months, if not weeks, <laughs> away. Well, hey, I think that we're probably a couple of years away because they yeah. they will do their best to continue to inflate the bulb. Now, of course, the longer it the longer it goes before the crash, the worse the, the worse crash is going to be. Well, and I mean, we're um, we never really paid for the crash of '08. That's true. So, I mean, we're we're due for a, a and it gets worse every time. Yeah. Like just like what you're saying, it's not. It doesn't get easier the longer it goes. Um, and and what I would say to people out there is that like this this sounds very doom and gloom, and in, in some ways it is. Um, but the truth is that that crash yeah. is what restores the health of the economy. Yeah. Yeah. That that's the correction that we need. Yeah. Um. It, it, otherwise, it, well, this just continues to get worse. You get runaway need, inflation. And we so need so. the correction, but we need the the response after the correction to be correct. Yeah. Well, it won't. Be. It won't be though. Well, I was fixing <laughs> to say like that's not going to happen. Yeah. Because if we had taken the medicine in 08, we could be prosperous now and not looking ahead to the next bubble yeah but we didn't do that but it's it's bad politically you need somebody really charismatic or somebody to just fall on the sword yeah um to uh to get people on board take the medicine yeah well, take the medicine now yeah um but yeah um the, so just prepare yourself for it and know that it'll pass well that's what i was fixing to say is like anybody who's paying attention sees what's coming and knows what's coming. And the best mm -hmm. thing you can do is to prepare for it. And mm -hmm. the way you prepare for it is to be ready to buy real estate when it crashes. <laughs> yeah. Or, or, you know, be ready to buy, be invested in commodities, be invested yeah. in real things um, because money isn't. Yeah. Well, that's the other thing is, is have your money put somewhere in something that's. Tangible. That has value of its own. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Right. So. Um, okay, let's wrap there. All right. Dude, I love talking economics, man. We're going to have to do more economics in the future. I mean, we'll have to. Yeah. <laughs> we, yeah. I'm, I'm sure that um, situations will arise yes. to give us the opportunity <laughs> to talk more about economics. Absolutely. Um, maybe even next week. Yeah, we'll see. Uh, so we, we plan to be back next week. Um, we're not even going to talk about like slipping in on <laughs> and in between. Yeah. It, like if we, it, yeah, we should be back to regular schedule though. Um, okay. Is it yeah, the softball season? Um, Tuesday is the last game. So Thursday should be available again, unless they decide to sneak an extra game in, which could happen, but mm -hmm. not likely. Also, uh, just for everyone out there, um, during non softball season, <laughs> yeah, uh, we usually go out, um, a couple of nights before, the podcast. Yeah. And so we get to kind of, um, chat things out and discuss what we might want to talk about and, uh, have a better and, idea going in. Yeah. Cause we're kind of um, going in. Yeah. Right now it's like, right uh, now. we show up and you're like, uh, do you have anything to talk about? Uh, do you have anything to talk about? <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, and just, you know, I mean, we're always winging it. None of this is scripted ever, but, yeah. um, if we've gotten to talk to each other about some of these topics a little bit, we've uh, beforehand. Yeah. yeah kind of, um, it goes smoother anyway. Yeah, I that's think. True. I hope. Yeah. <laughs> well, I don't know that I hope. I hope it doesn't go smoother because I hope that the, they're always just as smooth. <laughs> that there's time. an equal amount of smoothness on every episode. <laughs> but the number of times in this episode that it was like, "What were we talking about?" Yeah, <laughs> I think kind of belies that. Anyway, um, yeah. So in, in the meantime, though, of course, uh, follow us on Facebook. You can subscribe on iTunes, Podbean, or YouTube, and or YouTube. All three. Yeah. Um, like and share, comment, uh, tell your friends. The the likes, the shares, and the comments actually in all of those platforms all, all help us. Oh, yeah. By the yeah, way. Absolutely. Um, engagement makes a difference in, in, our, in the way the algorithms treat our product. Content, yeah. yeah. Um, so, yeah, all of that helps us, and uh, we really appreciate it. Um, and we like to interact. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, if you put it on Facebook, uh, Liberty Larry will have to tell me about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, cause I don't check that stuff on my own, but, uh, yeah, everywhere else I see the stuff on YouTube. Yeah. Except yeah. There's, there's so few people that do YouTube cause we don't actually have video. Yeah. yeah. Um, we hadn't really put a lot into YouTube, so. Everything's up there. 
No, I'm just saying like. Except for the couple of podcasts that they pulled down yeah. due to uh, disinformation or misinformation. I'm talking about just like promoting it YouTube. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I mention it every podcast. <laughs> you do mention it every podcast. Uh, anyway. <laughs> and that's all it gets. <laughs> yeah, that's true. The, yeah, it's not like we put a whole lot into every, anything else either. <laughs> well, though. Yeah. yeah. Fair enough. Um, but uh, yeah, do all those things or some of those things, any of those things that you want to do. Yeah. Um, you can always email me uh, if you have comments or uh, suggestions or anything at uh, michael at the liberty um, Remember, we would like to hear specifically about the sound quality on this podcast oh, yeah. to make sure that we're doing that, that we're upgrading and not making it worse. And uh, yeah, we'll be back in a week when we finally get this right. And in the meantime, try to stay free. Life short, live free. Ciao. Later.